Good evening and welcome to Real Talk with Anelo on SABC3, The Stage is Yours. My guest today is a multi-award winning TV personality, producer, activist, speaker, and now author. She made her debut on our screens as the dynamic journalist Teho and Generations from the year 2000 to 2004. And if you thought that glitzy and glamorous magazine type TV show started recently, well, I mean... I have news for you. This lady has been there and she's done all of that and more. As she was the presenter of Studio 53, a continental magazine show for five seasons, amongst, amongst many other things that she's done. She starred on the Oscar nominated film Hotel Rwanda. She was one of the main characters of a film called The Other Woman. She's worked with and co produced alongside some of the best producers on the African continent and now owns her own pan African talent agency. Most of you probably know who I'm talking about already. Ready, but there's some of you who are like, hmm, I wonder what she's talking about. This is for you. It's impossible living in the same house as her. You'll just have to sort out your differences. Do you think I haven't tried? She is downright hostile towards me. She hates me and makes no secret of it. You don't walk it. If you don't believe me, why don't you ask her? In fact, why don't you do just that? It's ever out, here and now. We look upon our client. <laughs> How convenient. We are all adults. We'll have to find a way to compromise. She doesn't want to compromise, damn it. You saw what she was like this morning. The minute she isn't the center of attraction, she starts sulking. She feels sidelined. Uh, so this is all about her. What about me? You haven't exactly gone out of your way to make me feel welcome. The one thing I won't compromise on to make you happy is my relationship with Karab. Mm -hmm, I didn't think so. What are you doing today? The lieutenant, sir. He wants to see the guest list. Go and get these boys some more beer. Yes, eh? boys, we like beer. Thank you. Come with me, please. Sir, that was two weeks ago. Shh. I thought you might need it. You have children, remember? And you're not going to get anything out of Sipo. And the church said, Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome on your screens right now, Rosie Mutene. <laughs> Thank you. Listen, mm. I have a drinking game for you. <laughs> Let's go back and watch you in generations. Mm -hmm. And every time you fold your arms, we drink. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be drunk. We're going to be drunk. <laughs> How about when I didn't used to do my hair? Dude, that was your move. I remember now. You always like, <laughs> all the time. That song all is done. All the flicking of my hair. <laughs> Flick of the hair. <laughs> but okay, fine. As, as ladies now, mm. here's the worst part of this. You probably thought you were big then. Oh, yes, I, I know. You probably thought you were I thought massive. I was huge. And you thought you, you needed to lose more weight. In fact, the producers told me I needed to lose more weight, believe it or not. <laughs> Babe, when you face the side here, you didn't, <laughs> you didn't have a shadow. <laughs> you can literally catch me by my waist, like in between. <laughs> you are so skinny, you could have made a U-turn in a horse pipe if you put your mind to it. <laughs> I know, I know. Okay. And I was living on protein shakes at the time. We can we tell. You know, we can tell. <laughs> like, <laughs> With my hair and crossing my arms. As the kids would say these days, your waist was snatched, honey. <laughs> <laughs> you were and that was natural. I didn't have to put those waist trains. It was, it was there, baby. You were snatched. <laughs> Listen, thank you so much for your time. No, thank you. And thank I you. must kick it off with a little message that you wrote for me in your book, mm. uh, Reclaiming the Soul. You said, Dear Anele, my journey is unconventional, but it is one that should be shared. Love, Rosie Mutene. And this is why you're here, because this hour we need to share this, because yeah. I read your book and I felt your life has been... Just contradictions, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. You know, there's people who are supposed to love you, but mm. they treat you with hate. You know, you're supposed to feel included, but mm. yet... I, I, on the outskirts. Yeah, always on the outskirts of, you know, of everything that's happening. You know, you have lots of family, mm -hmm. you know, even the ones that were, were adopted family and the real family, mm -hmm. but actually you have no family. Mm. 
right? And the entire time, my heart was just constantly breaking on your behalf. Um, would you say the buzzword in your life has mm. been contradiction? Absolutely. Yeah. Contradiction and um, unconditional love. Mm. You know, um, and conditional love. Yeah. And, and in therapy, the conditional versus unconditional was something that I really needed to totally unpack and yeah. totally understand. And also come to terms with, with that I'm also blessed. I've, mm. got, I've got a mother and, and a father who's late now and family who never ever turned around and said, well, we're not going to welcome you back. And that is conditional. Yes. yes. And I was a brat. Yeah. No, no. I was a brat. No, no. <laughs> I mean, and I like the fact that, you know, there, you make some, some very deep statements about yourself. Mm. And there are very few people who can make some scathing remarks about themselves on paper. Yeah. Because that's going to stay forever. Yeah. So it means you understood that you were a brat. At times you weren't grateful. Mm. Um, you know, you hated being black. Yeah. Right? But also, yeah. yeah, but also, do you realize that that was also y y your, your mind had been picked at mm. very quickly? Because no one told you being black is wrong, mm. but no one ever showed you that being black is right. Yeah, very, very true. Right? Very, and and there, were, there were no signs or any, any examples or role models or people around that could guide me another way. Yeah. So when I did have a specific role model or somebody on TV, mm. like it was Alice Chavanduka, and I was like, oh, it's a black girl who sounds like me. Okay. You know, um, and, and small things like that, but it was never in the mainstream. It was never every single day, mm. you mm. know. Um, like, I'll never forget, you were telling a story about when you came with your mom into Johannesburg on the bus, mm. and you were carrying the TV, and you were doing stuff together. You did it together. Yes. When I traveled with my mom, I hated being with her. I was embarrassed. You let her walk ahead, or oh, you'd, you'd walk, walk in behind. Front. Yeah. Uh, but what story were you being sold? Because, you know, for somebody who doesn't know your story, mm. you were born... And initially, they told your mom, give birth, leave the child at, in mm. the plus, and then come back and work, because your yes. mother was a domestic worker. Absolutely. The family falls in love with you. Yeah. And then? And, and when, I, when, I was, when I started writing the story, and I spoke to mama about it, and, and in her words, she was like, I became, I became the new to toy in the house. So mm. the family fell in love with me and so forth. And then the de some decisions were made. And to this day, I don't exactly know what the conversation was, um, when I speak to mama about it, there's a bit of pain and a bit of hurt, and I'm not prepared to go there too far because I think I've caused her enough pain. Uh, um, but I know that there was, some, there was some agreement where this family were going to make this wonderful sacrifice and give me all of these things that, 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 that my, my, my biological family could never give me. Yeah. Um, and I understand now where my biological family were coming from because it was, th that's unconditional love. Mm. They were doing it for mm. their child. Much like you said, your dad gave up music mm. because of his unconditional love for your mother yeah. because it was taking up time that he could be spending with her. Absolutely. You know, did you sometimes, you know, do the rationale and say, you know, he gave up music for my mom, mm. he gave up me for my life? Yeah, a lot of the time. And only, only when I went back to Pugeng in my late 30s mm. and started to see this man and also started once again that reality of, wait a minute, why, am I, why have I resented my biological father for so long? and then wake up at five in the morning and he's woken up. I was like, oh, okay, we both the same. We drink the coffee, our coffee the same. Um, one day breaks out into song. And I'm like, who is this singer? And he's telling me that he was in a choir and this beautiful baritone voice. And those things, whether they were there as a child, I didn't notice them. Mm. But because I was evident there and seeing my dad and, and, and seeing my mom and, and, and in different eyes, mm. it was, it was amazing. I have mm. got no words to describe it, you know? You, you, you speak of the mother figure who mm. was your adoptive mother. Yeah. Why did they never legally adopt you? It wasn't allowed. It was apartheid. Okay. Um, that's, that's the reason that I can understand. And, and, you know, there were times that I had to work through therapy thinking, well, did they really see me as their child? Yeah. You know, um, maybe it was just, okay, well, she's the adopted one, but we'll just keep it that way. Yeah. I don't know, you know, but, but I, know, I know one of the main reasons is because it was apartheid. Yeah. You know, um, and why I never, ever really converted to Judaism as, at a young age. Yeah. Those are some of the questions that I kept on asking myself as well, was yes, I was a family when it, when it was fine, part of the family when it was fine, and then, okay, mm. well, remember, know your place type of thing. So sit with the, the sit maids, with sit with the yeah. gardeners. Yeah. You see, you constantly in the book, you, 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 there's a common thread when you speak about your, your adoptive mother mm. and her a character is that what she says goes and no one else can argue yeah. with it. Yeah. So I almost feel like, and this is a big assumption, and you'll have to walk me through this, mm. that 
when you were there and you were born and you were two months old, she said, we're adopting her and that's, that's it. it. And people had reservations about it, yeah. but they didn't raise them. And the only time they raised them was quietly through or your... Or on, on, on the wrong places. Or, or, or and only directed to you. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and through, through, through mannerisms. Yes. You know, um, you so know, like I actually don't want you here. Don't want you here, and that was very, very evident in in, in my in the, in their younger son, mm. who, who who I used to just adore, and I just wanted to be like him because I just thought he was so cool. Yeah. But he really didn't give me the time of day. He was he he totally ignored me. You know, there was there was another another member of the family who I mentioned in the book who said those horrible things to me. Yes. And would just totally ignore me. So I knew that okay, I couldn't. I was too scared to be in alone uh, alone in a room with that person. But nobody ever stopped him or, or stopped certain people if they came in and say, you're sitting there and you're me. It will be greeting, hi, Asanda, hi, Tony. Boom, next person. Mm. And it was normal. Back to contradictions, because mm. now you said you never want to be alone in a room with them because mm. that's, that, that's feeling unsafe, right? Yeah. So here you are in Emerentia, the suburb that, you know, is, is blocked off and it's the safest suburb in the world yeah. because no one here, you know, the black people can't reach here to hurt us, mm. yet it's where you feel the most unsafe. Yeah, and the most vulnerable. Growing up during the apartheid era here in South Africa was not easy. For Rosie, it was worse as she was raised during that period by her Jewish foster parents and family. And she often had to call restaurants and movie houses prior to getting there to find out if would they let the black girl in. Come on, man. Uh, look, that could have been enough to knock any young girl's self-esteem to a bare minimum. But Rosie, as you can see, did not, did not let that put her down. It only pushed her further. We'll hear about more of her story after the break. Stay with us. Hello Africa And welcome to Studio 53 once again Our first story is a search for a successful African exhilarating adventure The kind that involves snow We found it in the mountain kingdom Lesotho in the land of the Basotho that, ladies and gentlemen, was our <laughs> guest, Rosie, when she was the studio and field presenter of Studio 53 alongside Gaetano Kahwa from Uganda, a role she filled from 2004 to 2007. Rosie trained as an insert producer and director for the show, a role she filled until 2010. This, however, was not the first time we saw her on our screens because she was already well-known and hated by some as Teho in Generations, a name some still call her by. I know. No, man. <laughs> yes. Really? Yes. <laughs> a lot of people still confuse me with Julia. I was going to say that. Yeah, that so it's Julia, it's Julia or, or Teho. Which was played by Koyle Shabala. Yes, and okay. that, was, that was Akin's um, wife. Wife. But the funny story, and I always tell the story, is that my second name is Debojo, so it's T. Oh and I remember going and opening up a bank account, and I filled in all of the necessary details. And then the bank person put on her piece of paper, no, Rosie Tsekhomutin. I'm like, no, that's... She goes, no, Kiwan. I was like, yes, I know, but, but my real name is Debojo. <laughs> no, 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 Kitsilho, Kitsilho. I'm like, no, it's Debojo. <laughs> but yeah. that was... That was very big for you to be on Generation. Yeah. Did you feel the magnitude of that? Yeah, you know what? It's, it, I felt the magnitude, but it was also it was a, a, a decision that I wanted to, to, to get into. Okay. Because when I was researching at university, I was thinking, well, what do, where do I want to take my career? And I was like, okay, look at Generations. I yeah. did my research. At the time, it was four and a half million viewership a day. Sure. That was a lot for back then. Yeah. And you know what Mfundi did for black people um, sorry to use the correlation, but but it's what the Cosby's did for black people in yeah. the 70s. Yeah. For the first time, yeah. you saw black people on screen. They weren't drug addicts. They weren't thieves. They mm. weren't. They were high-powered people. You know, beautiful, mm. intelligent, running their own businesses. Had intent. Yeah. We're not living from day to day. It was like yeah. there was a vision. Yeah. And the, and of course it. the typical South African adage: they spoke so well. <laughs> you know? And then enter you there, yeah. who then really spoke well. <laughs> Confused everybody. <laughs> We're just like, wait a minute, where did she grow up? But I feel like even prior to you doing your drama degree, yeah. uh, you know, back to that contradictions things I was talking about, yeah. is that, you, you know, your upbringing taught you to communicate or to see what people are saying without mm -hmm. them saying it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which then, it was a, a bad situation, but it helps when you act it. Absolutely, because it prepares you for that role, yes. and it prepares you for that for that level of contradiction. Yeah, and then you've already you've already got the feelings and the emotions inside of you. So w if they're going to be coming out negative, well, okay, I've been in the situation before. Let's go. <laughs> you, ah. know? you know. Did you find that? And it's so funny. An actor once said this to me, and he said the reason th there's so many divorces and failed relationships um, with, within actors and actresses is that 
in your real relationship, mm -hmm. instead of reacting that way, you store that reaction and you whip it out when you're <laughs> acting. It's very true. Oh. It's very, very true. And But that's also one of the reasons why I've stayed so long not wanting to get into a relationship because I need to make sure that when I'm going to be sitting and lying in bed with this person for the rest of my life, yeah. it's rosy. And okay. going through my 20s, it was, I was still in denial. And then in my 30s, I was like, okay, wait a minute. Whoa, yeah. Let me just, because I mean, I've been in serious relationships, but I got out because I was like, um, no, actually. Mm -mm. Do you self-sabotage yourself in relationships? I, I used to. Uh, a lot. I can relate to a that. A lot. Totally. Yeah. You know, I mean, we were talking off air about our bodies. So yeah. the minute I put on weight, well, I was, oh my God, well, he's not going to like me like this because I'm yeah. doing this. Or yeah. if I don't have my weave on, they're not going <laughs> to like me. You know, I say, God, I've gone over that phase. Because <laughs> you know? you're but, like, oh my word, he likes me, but I'm so fat. Okay, yeah. let me lose weight and then I'll date him. Yeah. You know, or he's I, like, I laugh too much. Or, or he, oh, I drink Jack Daniels. Is he going to like it? Or I, I drink wine. You know, yeah. back then I smoked. And so it was, it was all of these different things. And, and then you find excuses for them to, mm. to not like <laughs> you. You know, and you then they're like, you just afraid me, Bella. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, I told you. Right? <laughs> How many people have you friend zoned? And then everyone's like, no, they're just my friends. Like, no, dude, he totally likes it. Yeah. But, but also, that's another thing was that because I think so, somebody who's really, really amazing, he can only be my friend. Yeah. And then, and then you've put, been in the friend zone for so long and you've intimidated for so long that when he puts his hand in your leg, he's like, what the hell are you doing? You're my brother. Mm. Um, no, I actually wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> just like, oh, <laughs> this is all good. I changed yeah. in front of you. <laughs> You know, you've been there too, girl. <laughs> so, sad thing in your life when your adoptive father passes away, mm -hmm. Papa Joe, yeah. right? Now, and then a family member makes you go get panados next to his dead body, mm. right? How do you not crack then? How do you still keep it so composed and cry later? I got used to not showing too much emotion. And also around that time, because I kept on being told, don't cry in front of mommy because she's going to be too upset. Don't feel this. So I was already in my cocoon bubble, even from, from the time when I was told. So a family member didn't come to, to, to pick me up from school or tell me. Yeah. They sent the neighbor. And I yeah. understood that they, they needed to send somebody. Yeah. But for me at that age, looking back, rather just send him, send the neighbor, tell them to come to the house and we'll sort it out. Yeah. But it wasn't, you know. And so when that happened was, I was too scared to stand up to this family member. And I thought, okay, let me just, let me just deal with this. Let me just deal with this. I can do this. Did I you mill about outside the room before you went no, in? No, no, she stood in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the passageway. So I literally opened. And as I was opening, I could see it there. And another family member was like, Rosie, don't go. And I was like, okay, I can do this. And I just walked. And the bed was there, and then he had to walk through to the change room and then through to the bathroom. So it's not like it was boom, boom, out. It was boom, boom, and then walking out like. And that's your dad. That's you know. my dad. That was because, my daddy. Yes, because I, 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 you say in the book that if there's anyone that loved you for real, mm. you know, it was him. And then you weren't allowed to be part of the funeral. Yeah. Now, is that because you're black or is it because you're not Jewish? Um, I think it's, it's, it's both. Okay. And, and for the viewers out there who don't know in, in Judaism is that um, the mourners, the immediate family, they, you've got to tear off a piece of clothing and that piece of clothing goes in, into, into the grave. And it dates back to the time that so people on the street would see which family are actually mourning. And I'd already prepared myself. And mm. every single person of the family, children were, were, were called out except for me. And once again, it was that silent tears inside mm. saying, well, what about me? I, <laughs> I, w I was his daughter. You, you, was, you got so used to crying inside, yeah. bruh. Mm. But you see, as, 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 as now I look at my mother, and I think my biological mother, yeah. and I think, how many times did she cry inside? Yeah. How many times was she wrenched mm. and torn apart inside? Because it's one thing for you to not be around your child, to watching mm. her grow up. It's another to be watching her through this glass, right? And almost like a one-way mirror where yeah. she, you can see everything she's doing, but yeah. she cannot see you. Mm -mm. And you've had those conversations with your mother where you've forgiven each other, right? Yeah, yeah. We, we've, we've had those conversations, but once again, when I got too deep, I could see the pain. Mm. And because I was in a place where this is, it's about me creating repair, mm. I don't want to cause that pain to my mom again. Mm. I don't, I don't want her to feel humiliated. I want her, if she's going to be crying over me, so it's happy tears. Happy tears. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the promise that I've made to myself and that's the promise I've made to God. It's time. Is that it's time, it's, yeah. just, it's just happy tears, you yeah. know, and it's about, it's about respecting her. Mm. 
because I never did that growing up. And I suppose, you know, that's also another reason why I wasn't ready to give, have a child, because I thought, well, if I'm going to give birth to a, to a brat like this, mm. um, and yeah, so it's, it's, about, it's about that respect and, and acknowledgement of who she is and what she is, because she's, she's never been put onto a pedestal. Never. Mm. I mean, even for a long time, I didn't even call her mum. I called her Bumba. What did that do to her? How would you like it if your son didn't call you by mama, or called you by something else, a derogatory name? And then still watch the child call somebody else mom. Mm. I hear what you're saying. Mm. I hear what you're saying. <sighs> Look, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, but before we do, I must remind you that remember for the past two weeks, we've been speaking about how you can win yourself the new Huawei P20. Remember, right? You do. Good. Pay attention to this. Real Talk, Huawei and MTN are partnering up to celebrate the release of the new Huawei P20 series. The Huawei P20 Pro, the world's first triple Leica lens camera, is partnering with MTN SA's fastest mobile network to help you capture the best moments with your friends and family. We'll be capturing timeless moments and connecting with people in need while giving you the chance to win the Huawei P20 Pro and 10 gigabytes free once-off MTN data. So tune into Real Talk for your chance to win. Welcome back you with Real Talk with Anele right here on SABC3 where the stage is yours. If you thought that the hashtag MeToo movement was far away from home, then you must think again because recently South African actresses have started coming forward to speak about sexual harassment in the industry. Rosie Mutene, a seasoned, a seasoned TV personality who has been abused and assaulted twice before in her life, was one of those women brave enough to speak up because somewhere, somehow, some way, someone has to be called to order and the harassment simply has to stop. So the first time you deal with a physical uh, assault, because mm. I feel that your childhood was an emotional assault yeah, to you, yeah. you know, so we've gathered that much. Mm. But the physical assault is your, your ex-boyfriend, but then boyfriend David yeah. in varsity. Yeah. And I'm giving him a name because that's his name. Yeah. Um, and he's the only name, the boyfriend that I actually named in the book. Because I think that we need to, to, yes. to talk about and bring it to the forefront. Yeah. Give abuse a name yeah. and a face. Yeah. There you go. And so he beats you up because he finds you hanging out and dancing with, you know. And disobeyed him. Oh, of course. Yeah. Because that's what you do. Yeah. You're here to obey him. Yeah. And he beats you up. And I just, what shocked me is the, the continuous in the one night mm. where it's almost like the more he sees you, the angrier he gets yeah. and he just continues to, to beat yeah. you up. And was he already emotionally abusive? Where, whilst he was beating you up, mm. I, I get it, you're shocked, but you're not surprised. Yeah. You know, and that, that's when I realized, and that's why I needed to, to understand what abuse really was. Yeah. Because, you know, I came from a family, I mean, my, 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 my adopted father always said to me, the man, minute a man hits you, you walk away. Mm. But if I'd known those signs of emotional and financial abuse up to that point, perhaps it, couldn't, it wouldn't have led to that. So when I mean financial was that it w I was working as a waitress at a pizza place, I used to give him part of my money, because that's what I thought you do. You know, you've got to give your money to your boyfriend. Um, emotional abuse telling me, well, I was at the first year university, I'm stupid, I would never ever finish university, I'm fat, um, my friends are this, all of these different things building all up to that. Mm -hmm. So when it did finally hit, it really, when he did finally, when he did hit me, I wasn't surprised, but it was also, I was like, okay, well, what do I do? Let me get out of the situation. Not once did I think, well, you know, bug you or F you. Mm. It was like, I've got to hide this. If this is my problem, I've got to deal with this. I can't see my f my school friends. Yeah, they can't, see they cannot me see me like this. Being beaten up by yeah. my boyfriend. Let and, me and take it off campus. Yes, let me take it off campus. And that's, that's why I, I owe it to my friends so much for the next day because they all came the next day yeah. and a friend of mine called me. She was like, I told her what happened and she said to me, and unfortunately Nikki's late at the moment, but she said to me, she goes, Rosie, this is not on. Uh. And it was Emmanuel Casters, it was um, another friend, and, and Adam Crosdale, another guy, Patrick, Dimitri Kassar, and they all just came and they were like, you don't have to tell her, but we're here and this is not what men do. And if I hadn't had that day, I think... Yes, I had problems in other relationships, but mm. my problem with men in general mm. would have been a lot worse. Mm. And also it was, you know, just people coming around to not say, 
Well, what did you say? Yeah. Or what, well, what did you do? What did you do? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's or, not. Oh, you must do the. You must do yeah. the. Whatever you decide. If you want to care, go to the police. If you don't, if you need, if you need a cup of tea, if you need this, whatever, yeah. we're here. Just know that you've got your support. Uh. And 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 that's why I think I I, I I sympathize so much with people who go through it because I understand the importance of that support. Yeah. You know, even even with the incident that happened to me in Botswana, yes. the support I had from total strangers. Yeah. You know, I had a total stranger having to go to my hotel room, pack up my mum, and I'd been there for a week, so all my stuff was everywhere. Scattered, girl. I mean, my underwear, yeah. my stuff. Yeah. You know, packed, some packing of, it all some up. Some of the panties must have been hanging on the shower door. Yeah. You know, we're black like that. You so know, yeah. <laughs> you wash and wear, you wash and wear. <laughs> and so, and so, and, and that support, and then the support that I got from people online and people... You know, uh, yes, it was, there was a lot of negativity around, mm. but it was just knowing that actually, you know what, you, you, you can get through this. It's another channel. But here's the thing, mm. because I, I, I refreshed my memory mm. with that Botswana incident, and, and I came to the realization that even with the negative, mm. it was still, in a way, working towards what our cause is, because, yeah. you know, the comments were, women get beaten up here all the time, mm. Rose is not the first yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. You constantly and, and there was that one tweet that ran through my head yeah, the whole time right yeah because surely that means this is why we need to speak up precisely how is it normal that women get beaten yeah. up every day and we and must we just be to fine with quiet. it and then there's also the denial aspect so when i went back for 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 the mediation yeah. and sitting with 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 him and his and, and his lawyer and everything and the conversation afterwards because we had we had sorted it all out was um well there's woman abuse doesn't really happen in botswana so i said well tonight i'm going to the opening of a woman's shelter if they isn't it happening? Why is the shelter? Yeah. And the excuse from the one guy was like, no, 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 maybe they just don't have homes. I'm like, okay, this is like on another level of denial. Why Come don't on. they have homes? Why have they left their homes? Yeah, precisely. They don't have houses, so this is why they need houses. Uh. You know? And, and, you know, when it comes to being an activist, and, and I see this is why as well, there was a lot of hesitation mm. um, with Hollywood in, in terms of coming, coming, not even coming clean, mm. that's wrong to say, coming out and, yes. and speaking out, yes. right? Is that at times you you aren't you scared that it, it will dilute the fact that you are an actress, the fact yeah. that you are a thespian, you are yeah. a director, you're a producer, that's who yeah. you are. Yeah. You know, and now you're you you're an activist as well. Mm. Because a lot of the negativity as well was, oh yeah, no, her career is failing, so she yeah. just needs this something. This is what she needed to do. To, yeah. To do. What, e even even when when the incident happened with 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 uh, in in the at the Durban Film Festival with that filmmaker, yeah. when he called me a C O C K teaser. Yeah. I mean, my first instinct was to go tell people. I think, well, why am I going to tell people? What what relevance is it going to have? So let it be. Mm. And then when I saw the 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 commonality of. He contacted me on LinkedIn first. Mm. Then he did this, mm. and it was all come and watch my my, my Mandela documentary, mm. you know. And then sitting in the room, and and it was literally I turned around, and, and it was that split second that I saw him lying on the bed, and I was like, whoa, because I thought he was gay. Yeah, okay. I thought he was gay. So the night before, we were holding, we were out, all drinking, having fun. I literally thought. So when he when he put his hand on my leg, I didn't think of it as a, as a sexual innu innuendo. Yeah. So when I saw him lying in the bed, and he was like, do you want a cup of cappuccino? Uh, uh, do you want a cappuccino? I was like, oh, wait a minute, Rosie, you've clocked this wrong. Yeah. Get out now. Yeah. And it wasn't, you know, I've been in those scenarios. I have been, in, I mean, clearly my gay is totally off because I've been in that situation where I thought somebody was gay and they weren't, but I didn't feel threatened. But with him, I felt threatened. Mm. You know, and, and so... Your intuition is never And wrong. as a woman, we've got we to yeah. believe that intuition. And so, so when it was ha happening with all these other people, and, and I didn't know about the girls from, from a couple of years ago, people yeah. were like, no, but this, this has been rehashed. This is, this That's is when loaded. I was like, no, but wait a minute, it did happen. And e whether people believe me or not or whatever, or they're going to say, well, it happened a long time ago, yeah. I need to voice my opinion because the, there is a certain po point in, in, in a certain part in society that they will listen to me yeah. more than they're going to listen to a young girl who was working in a hotel. Who actually is trying to get into the industry thank you right yeah which is um i remember having this conversation with phil who's our entertainment mm. guy and yeah, we love phil oh <laughs> phil, we love phil you phil needs his own show yes. as i said phil, yes. phil you're gonna get your own show which is this camera phil you're gonna get your own show <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, been said. yes. <laughs> and 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 I, I almost lost it with with the fact that you know you question these young girls who say that they've been mistreated on sets mm. because you need to understand that being on tv and being in the entertainment industry it's a dream yeah and it's it's one that's you don't know if you're going to get it. You could study and have it's, a doctorate it's, it's in back entertainment, and, yeah. guys. 
you don't know if you're gonna mm. get it. Mm. If I study accounting, I know I'm gonna become an yeah. accountant. Yeah. I must just pass well, I must do my article, yeah. and I must it's go guaranteed. It's guaranteed, whereas yeah. with us, it isn't. Yeah. So there you are on a set, and let's talk about the Zabalaza yeah. one, right? Yeah. There you are on a set, you are seasoned. Mm. You are Rosi Mutene, and even you are having to deal with and, this. And deal with these, and I'm so glad you brought up the Zabalaza thing, because you know it happened in 2015, and, and cut a long story short, I mean, it could have been totally avoided. Yes. Because number one, I read my contracts. So any, any actor, thespian, crew member, read your contracts. So when, they, when the script came and I was, it was sex scenes and so forth, and I said to the director, what's the scenario, call my agent, no, well, if, if there are sex scenes, we've got to have a meeting, sit down, talk about it, no, the script's going to be changed. Cool. Great, let's go into it. Script, the same thing happens. It's a different director. What are you comfortable with? I was like, okay, let's just, let's just work around and see what. Small pieces of, 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 of lingerie rock up, and I'm like, no, come guys. If it's going to be on this level, I should have had maybe a wardrobe call before and so forth. I refuse to wear it. I could do that because I'm a seasoned actor. Mm -hmm. Other actresses wouldn't have done that. Um, got to a point where I had a meeting with the producer, I had a meeting with my director, with, with, with my agent at the time. You know, by the way, my agent was very quick to tell me, listen, you don't want to make too much noise, then you won't work again. And that's when I was like, okay, well then I'd rather not work with these people. Yeah. And then it got to the point where I was lied to again, because the one director said to me, well, you know, you need to, uh, um, well, you'll just take off your jacket and then you'll just get under the bed. And I said, that's fine, but I'm going to be wearing clothing underneath. Not a problem. Did that. After the scene, okay, we move in. We'll just put a boob tube under you. You'll be underneath. I was like, no, it doesn't work that way. No. And I said, no. And that's when I resigned, you know. And now fast forward to this and, and obviously it came out and it came out using the names and so forth. And why I think it's so important to bring it up today, especially today, is because the new management of, of Urban Brew came forward. We spoke about it, and, and the changes that they've made are concrete on set. Yeah. The changes that they've made, I, I believe, are genuine as opposed to what happened before. Yeah. And, and now no actor or actress is ever going to suffer on set again because they have put in these places, they're going to be working closely with SWIFT, they're going to be working closely with, with South African Guild of Actors because they understand the need for creating these safe spaces yes. for people in the industry. So Yes, you left the job, mm. but your job wasn't done. My job wasn't done. Then. Okay. <laughs> Look, they say a woman who changes her her is about to change her life. When Rosie did the big chop, however, it was not only for the love she had for a dear friend, but it was the beginning of yet another phase in her life, her journey to herself. We'll find out more about this after the break. You have to stay with us. Ten years ago, Rosie Mudene embarked on a journey of self-discovery. In the process, she began to document her life, experiences, and attempted to tackle some of her inner demons and personal issues, which all culminated in her recently released autobiography, Reclaiming the Soil, not soul, but you'd be forgiven for making that mistake, Reclaiming the Soil, a black girl's struggle to find her African self. Now, you're from Rastenberg. Mm -hmm. So, okay. w when you say soil, <laughs> I get what you mean. <laughs> Everyone is like, okay, <laughs> we hear you. Because <laughs> all there is is soil there. <laughs> and that, that's why I had to use the coloring. Yes, the, the red. The red dust. Dude, yeah. it's totally it, yeah. right? Mm. So, you said this book took you 10 years to yeah. write. Yeah. One long therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would imagine. Yeah. What, what were the toughest questions you had to ask yourself in this 10 year long therapy session? Um, who are you? Mm -hmm. um, are you? Are you proud of, of who, 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 what you've done mm. and who you've become? And a lot of the time the answers were no. And it's interesting because there were points in the book that I'd left out. And I was doing another show where I actually interviewed uh, Zulega Mandela and it was on her book, When oh. Hope Whispers. And that book was just Dude. phenomenal. Oh. And I said to her, I was like, you, you, you come from such a prominent family, but yet you were so brutally honest about so many things in that book. And that shocked me. And she said to me, if you're going to tell your story, tell all of it, otherwise don't tell it at all. Mm. And that's when I, I, I took a break from the book and then I went back. And I revisited everything from the beginning. So... I, in the beginning, I, over, I overlooked the abortion. Mm. I went back, mm. and I realized I hadn't dealt with that pain. I, I looked at the, the scenarios that I had with my mother, mm. realized I hadn't dealt with that pain. 
uh, and, and try to bring closure to a lot of the things. A lot of the things I can never bring closure to because some of them involve Papa and he's passed on. Some of them involve Mama, I don't want to get into that because it hurts her. But as much as I can, especially about myself, and more importantly as women, yeah. one of the biggest difficulties that we have is forgiving ourselves. Yeah. So once all of it was out and I was like, okay, now we're dealing with the pain and then now it's, a, it's, it's time to look in the mirror and say, you know what, kid, you're okay. Yeah. Don't be so hard. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. You know? Because I suppose you think of the painful things that you, you, you think you did to other people a lot more than they think about them. Yeah. Right? So you live in it a lot more. Yeah. And also because you've been told so long, so for so many years, um, you're different and you're, you're, and you're better and you should be so lucky. So then why, why haven't I done this or, 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 you know, moved her in other areas of my life? Maybe I should have given my mother children or maybe I should, you know, all of these different things. But actually, it's okay. Mm. Every, everyone has their own challenges. Everyone has their own journeys. But it's for us to deal with them. You've got to deal with them. But then also just accept it. Mm. And make sure that if, if it's something that's really, really painful, don't repeat it again. Mm. And speaking of painful... Um, I think pain, pain is, is tied in, in, a, in a transition way to apology, mm. right? Uh, because to, to recognize pain means the beginning of an apology, yeah. either to yourself yeah. or to somebody else. Absolutely. Um, what apologies did you have to make to yourself mm. and then ultimately to other people? Yeah, um, definitely the number one apology, and, and, and I think I finally closed it off this year, was, was, was the abortion. Uh, the apology of the times that I, I, I was over excessive, especially in terms of drinking and, and yeah. alcohol, because that's an apology to my body. Yes. Um, apology to my mum. You know th that that scene where where she comes to wipe me at the in the toilet, and, and you I, say no. You know you my uh, you know oh. my mother. The apology that when I was a brat and I didn't want to go home to Pugeng, mm -hmm. and last minute just not go home, and then. When I was writing it, I imagined, because there's a walkway from the main road to our house, it's still a dust road, thinking she, walked, she, she was walking down there with all these packages, leaving her daughter behind. The apology to my mum that 365 days throughout the year, she had to be a maid to me, and then even when on her holidays, she still wasn't on holiday. Mm. You know, the apology that to my dad, and, and, and that also around about the time when just after he passed away, because I was also angry at myself because when he went into the private hospital, I put that money in and everything, and then I didn't have enough money to keep him in, in again. Yeah. And then that night thinking, well, ack, sorry, I was mm. saying, but if I had that extra 80 grand, maybe he would be alive. And then dealing with actually, no, it was, it was out of my hands. I did the best that I could. You know, the apology of me not being there for my sister's children. Mm. Being an aunt that they don't know. And, and the apology for myself for, for being that, but yet they still love me. Mm. Their children love me. Mm. I mean, they don't call me Gogo, they call me Gogolicious, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So it, it's that. And, 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 and just the apology of not, of not being around on Christmas time. Yeah. Or being able to sing a hymn in Swana at my Gogo's funeral. You know, and so it's, it's those, but you, you go through them and, and you, you find the forgiveness. I yeah. mean, still, there's still a lot I need to do. Yeah, yeah. But where I am and I look back, I pat myself on the back. Yeah. Which is before I wasn't being able to do that. Yeah. You know, when we were joking about my waist looking this thin, and <laughs> I hated my body back then. And now back, I was like, give me that body again, I'll be fine. Please, you know what I mean? <laughs> like the whole body could fit into these, this one, one leg of these jeans, you know what I mean? But, but, but that's, also, that's also with growing. That's with, 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 with going on journeys. That's with, with increasing in terms of your career and so forth. But it's as as women, we got we got to learn to like you know what it's okay, it's all right. You th you really are the only one thinking about it, mm. you know in th that intensely, you know th you know that lambasting, yeah. you know that judgment. You yeah. really are the only one yeah. doing it to yourself, yeah. and you're embellishing in yes. that. Yes, and it's just this monster that you're constantly feeding. Yeah, and and, and literally like that time when I was sitting at home and calling Mr. Delivery and <laughs> bottles of Malo and yeah. this and that, and you're just feeding a monster. Mm feeding a monster. 
Look, having to go through all of that and still be able to stand proud is why Rosie is the amazing woman we know her to be. Uh, just a reminder, speaking of amazing, if you'd like to get your hands on one of the amazing Huawei P20s, then this is how. This is the last time I'm going to remind you today, just by the way. Real Talk, Huawei and MTN are partnering up to celebrate the release of the new Huawei P20 series. The Huawei P20 Pro, the world's first triple Leica lens camera, is partnering with MTN SA's fastest mobile network to help you capture the best moments with your friends and family. We'll be capturing timeless moments and connecting with people in need while giving you the chance to win the Huawei P20 Pro and 10 gigabytes free once-off MTN data. So tune into Real Talk for your chance to win. If you've ever tried to put a face to the voice that serenades our national airlines, well, wonder no more because that face <laughs> is our guest today, Rosie Mutene. We know it's you, okay? Uh, Rosie has also graced the covers and pages of many South African and international magazines, including True Love, Cosmopolitan, Marie Claire, Destiny, and African Woman. A very interesting fact to note about our guest is that she is internationally accredited as a laughter coach. <laughs> So she teaches people how to laugh. <laughs> You're going to have to tell us more. <laughs> laughter is a best medicine. Yeah. And the thing is, even if you force laughter, it's still going to change and release endorphins in your mind. Yes. So, I mean, what, what, what you, the, the process that you take people through are different ways of laughing. And so we'll start off with a session and pretend we're sitting on the phone. Yeah. Now I'm going to answer the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You know what I mean? So, I mean, this is obviously a rush process, but there's so many different exercises that you can do. And I mean, one of my favorite exercises, and I always like to work on like a wooden floor, yeah. where you have, whether it's four or six people, but you put your heads together, and one person just starts to laugh, and then try and stop that person, and you okay. start laughing. And literally, it just, it gets to the point where people are actually calling out of the room because they're either crying or they need to go to the toilet. Oh, good. And, and it, it is a great stress reliever, it's a great thing for corporate, for, for, for corporate team building. Yeah. Um, if you've had trauma in your family and you just need to that, that release without feeling guilty, yeah. it is, it's one of the best moments. And when I'm going through really, really difficult times, I will laugh at any point. Yeah. And wake up in the shower, sit in the shower and laugh, brushing your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> and you carry on. You look, you look like you're losing your mind Absolutely. a little bit. But you know, it'll work at the end yeah. of the day. Listen, we've got a voice note. Uh, Lucky, I work with him on radio. He mm. was adopted mm -hmm. uh, at a very young age. Never knew his biological parents. Yeah. Um, adopted by an Afrikaans family. Oh, yes, I know. Yes, 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 yes. And yes, when yes. I was speaking to him today and I was saying, well, I'm going to chat to Rosie, he was like, I need to ask her something. So roll it. Hi, Rosie. Um, so the two things I always tell people that are going to adopt children or have adopted children is one if you're a white parent and you're adopting a black child do not try and cut your child's hair uh, the other is um, make sure that you teach your child from a young age to put cream on their body I learned this at a very late stage but the one thing I would like to know is what would you suggest or uh, would be a question that you would ask or tell um, adopted people definitely language ah one of my biggest crutches and problems that I've had in my life and only realizing later the importance of it mm. is that not lowering your language. And it's not just about being able to speak to the person on the street, is that once you know your language, you understand the essence of what it is to be Abotswana, whether it's Zulu, whether it's Venda, mm. the meaning behind what language is about. And the, the nuance, the Yeah, tones, and the power yeah, behind that narrative, yeah. you know, and that I've been robbed of. And as much as I've, I've taught myself, I mean, I really started learning Tswana properly when I worked at Generations mm. because I saw the makeup lady speaking <laughs> and I knew like, what they were saying. They're talking about me. But, but, but it's that, you know, it's those nuances that are there that are and th th that's what defines you as an African person. Mm. That's what defines you as, as a Greek person. That, you know, it is incredibly, incredibly important. And mm. so I think, you know, if anything for our government, we need to, English is fine because it's a universal language, but it needs to be compulsory to learn a, a proper vernacular language. Yeah. So listen, uh, in closing, mm. this didn't feel like a book to me. Mm. It felt like 
you and I missed our flight uh, to Cape Town, yeah. and we decided we need to be in Cape Town. There's no other flight. Let's drive. Yeah. And on the drive, you're just telling me stories about yourself. Yeah. And that's how they landed on me. And I really do feel like I know you and I understand you a bit better. Mm -hmm. But also, I feel like I, I, I now celebrate you on a, on a, on a, on a, on a deeper level of yeah. understanding of this is who you are, this is why you are, and this is why you, should, you shall continue to be. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Please go and get this book. Listen, it's, it's absolutely everything. Like I say, you feel like you're on a road trip and you're just getting to learn to know about someone. Uh, that's all we have time for with our amazing guest, Rosie Mutene, whose journey is nothing short of amazing, nor is it near the end, which is what I like. You know, I want to see what else Rose is going to do for us. Uh, we'd like to thank her for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, do grab yourselves a copy of her book, Reclaiming the Soil, and read all about her. For me and the rest of the team, this has been actually fantastic. Uh, good night. Isidingo's up next.